Grant, thank you very much for joining us today. Cameco is the second largest uranium producer in the world, and so you have great insights on what's happening with the uranium price and also the conversion pricing. And I want to discuss both of these topics, but before we do that, why don't we just start with the press release that you issued in early September, which provided an update on production. And within that press release, you noted that there were challenges at Cigar Lake and also at the ramp up at the Key Lake Mill. Why don't we begin right there and provide us with a little more context as to what's happening and if this is just a one-off. Yeah, you, you will have noticed that while we were talking about production to the end of this year, December 31st, we didn't change our guidance for 2024. We have multi-year production guidance out there. Uh, it's still 18 million pounds for MacArthur Key next year and 18 million for cigars. So that should be the, the clearest indication that this is, we view this as some short-term issues. Uh, we typically don't do off-cycle press releases. Uh, it's not something we normally do, but I think folks who know us really well notice, know that we're transparent and we're accountable. And we weren't about to go into uh, WNA week, which is the biggest week in the nuclear industry, see a global customer base, see a bunch of investors, see all our joint venture partners, and then sneak news like that out the back door later uh, and miss the opportunity to be held accountable for that news. So we put out the press release to make sure it was in the market and we could discuss it accordingly during the WNA week. So the main message, short-term issues, we, they won't affect next year's guidance, haven't affected next year's guidance. And, and if there's a takeaway to global fuel buyers, if there's a takeaway to investors, it, it probably is that uh, you know production should never be taken for granted. You know, the only people who tell you it's easy are the people who have never done it. So as the world needs more production to come online, it's part of why we are very confident that prices still need to discover levels that are going to incent meaningful investment in new supply. And we see that if you can't take current supply for granted, then we shouldn't be thinking that new supply is going to come and set records for on time and set records for, it's just, it's going to be difficult. And, uh, and we think that that uh, needs to be reflected in the market. So let's move the discussion toward the term market. I'm not going to ask you about the spot market because you always tell me that that's not the real market with uranium. But you also mentioned that you were in London for the World Nuclear Symposium. And why don't you give us some color as to what you're hearing from fuel buyers? Yeah. And and by the way, congratulations to you. You were you were at the at the WNA and you were front and center uh, with uh, with your with your uh, media opportunities. And sorry we didn't get a chance to do that uh, to have this chat during the symposium. Uh, as you know, Cameco, because we're right across the fuel cycle, involved in everything, uh, we just didn't end up being able to elbow out the time to do it. So I'm glad we're able to catch up now and reflect on some of the things that we've heard. The, the main takeaways from the WNA this year are, were obviously reflected in a very material increase in the need for supply reflected in the WNA fuel market report. So that demand outlook continues to grow. Tim Gitzel, our CEO, has called it the best ever. Um, we agree with that comment, obviously, not just because he's the boss, but I, I think the evidence is there. And there's a urgency of supply that's setting in. And so we're starting to see more of the utilities reflected in the in the long term contracting to date start to understand that. But, you know, our message hasn't changed back to the market, which is it's good to say there's an urgency of supply setting in, but it ultimately needs to be reflected in more of an urgency of demand. So the market needs to see more demand, more homes need to be built for future production as more demand comes to the market it obviously will strengthen uh, market opportunities and, and overall discover those production economic prices required, not to just bring back existing supply, but actually to invest in new supply going forward. So we still believe we're, we're in the rather early innings uh, of this transition. And so in, I'm sure you're talking to many utilities and I know you can't provide a lot of detail, but maybe you can just give us some color as to what terms they are asking for. And in, in, are they looking for production three years out, five years out, or are they going to 10 years? Yeah, great question. This market has moved away from a market dominated by surplus disposal in the spot market, by 
producers who have productive capacity but never did the hard work of building homes for it. So as they jammed it through the spot market, it had considerable downward pressure on the price. And in a low interest rate environment that persisted several years ago, that gave rise to the carry trade. That carry trade effectively moved the term market away from really focused on long-term requirements to a much shorter tenor where utilities were coming in and they were taking two to four year bites out of the market because they wanted someone to come in, buy surplus in, in, in the spot market, hold it on a very low cost of carry. And that effectively, you know, the, those producers who sell into the spot market effectively collapse the term price because the term price is supposed to be rooted in production economics. It collapsed to be nothing more than the carry, the forward carry on surplus spot disposal. As the spot market is tightened up, we've seen, I would say, three distinct changes to the market. Number one is tenors have gone back out. It is very common now for us to be involved in conversations with utilities. They're not looking for two to four years out. They're looking two to seven or two to 10 years out. And why that's important is because there's no carry trade. There's no buy today and hold it that satisfies that. It shifts the conversation back to incumbent producers. Secondly, volumes are going up, not just because more years are being added, but volumes are going up because utilities, watching the price strengthen, watching the thinness of the spot market, having real questions about where future supply is coming from, are looking to take bigger bites out of each year. So they're adding in more years and they're taking bigger bites out of each year. So tenors are going up, volumes are going up. And really interestingly, timeframes are going up. So even the utilities that are very forward thinking, the ones who uh, understand that the supply shouldn't be taken for granted and they come to the market early, even those utilities are not satisfied that they're well covered, say, till 2027 or 28. They're looking way out into the 2030s. So, for example, Bruce Power came to us and signed a deal 2030 to 2040. That's a pretty forward looking utility underpinning a very important source of clean energy there in Ontario for you. So with tenors going up, volumes going up, and timeframes going out, it really is that leading indicator that we're moving in to a more robust uh, security of supply-driven contracting cycle. In the past, a flex component was part of contracts whereby fuel buyers would be allowed to take delivery of additional pounds typically by a certain percentage amount. But is flex contracting still being included in new contracts? It would appear that uh, some of the folks that are offering material out into the future are also offering uh, more flex, more flex than we would be prepared to give, uh, that's for sure. But at this part in the cycle, when more demand is coming into the market, Producers are able to, to hold that flex capacity uh, more for themselves uh, and, and use that to drive future value going forward. So that is changing in the market. But, you know, if you look at some of the, the trade reporting, you would see that obviously there's some folks out there still willing to offer, say, a 10 percent flex on an annual uh, delivery. Now, flex actually uh, it needs to be thought of appropriately in our industry. Sometimes I get asked by investors, especially investors that are new to the space, well, that means you'd have less deliveries in a high price environment. And actually, the opposite is true. Uh, our fuel buyers tend to be pro-cyclical with their flex. The price of uranium is going up. It signals uranium is scarce versus signaling, oh, well, if the price is going up, there's going to be a lot of investment in future supply. It creates the opposite signal. If price is going up, it must be because it's getting scarce and therefore a utility is more likely to flex up when prices are rising. But when a utility flexes up with a producer, if that producer doesn't immediately have the pounds, then they might be encouraging that producer to go into the short-term market, the spot market and buy. And if a producer shows up to buy in the spot market, it's probably going to have a, an upward pressure on uranium prices. And if it's a market-related contract you're ultimately delivering into, well, then the utility is just going to pay more by forcing someone to flex up. So, so flex is, a, is, is kind of a complicated uh, aspect of contracting. But, but in general, um, producers are in a position where they can retain that flexibility for themselves under the new contract. And just to follow up 
question on contracting, but given this positive move that we've seen in both the spot market and the term market in the past year, what other clauses have you implemented so you can participate in these higher moves in the coming years? Right. So uh, just as a bit of a, a 101 on long-term contracting for folks new to the story, um, and we often hear this, people say, well, why are you doing any long-term contracting? Why would you be locking in the price today? Well, remember, in our industry, term contracts have two ends of the spectrum. There is the one end of the spectrum, which is a fixed price or base escalated term contract. And the way those work is you might come to Cameco and you might say, look, I'm, I'm looking for 200,000 pounds of uranium per year, 2025 to 2030, and I want it to be fixed. What we would normally do is we would turn to either Traytech or UX's long-term price indicator, which I think they're both right around $60 US today. And we don't really quarrel over where it starts, but we fight over how it escalates, how it escalates to first delivery and how it escalates through 2025 to 2030. Those contracts, uh, a lot of utilities want those because I think utilities have a sense the price of uranium is going up. So if you can fix something now, maybe you can avoid further increases in the uranium price. We're not overly interested in those contracts. What we prefer are contracts, this part of the cycle, are contracts that are market related. So you come to Cameco, you want 200,000 pounds, 2025 to 2030. We're not going to price those today. We're just going to agree how they're going to be priced out in the future at time of delivery. You might want it the spot price indicator. I might want a six month rolling average of the spot price. We might want to blend between the spot and term price at time of delivery. That's where we want to be. At this point in the cycle, looking at these supply demand uh, fundamentals, we want to be market related in order to have that leverage going out into the future. And it's very uncommon for a utility that agrees to a market related contract to be able to do that in an uncolored way. I mean, I can only think of maybe two or three utilities globally that are allowed to sign a market related contract with no floor, no ceiling. I mean, a utility typically has a value at risk metric. I mean, these are very complicated organizations. The, you know, our typical fuel buyer is a master's trained nuclear engineer. I mean, these are very clever people and managing risk is what they do. So this notion that, oh, you're going to sign market related contracts and they're going to be completely uncollared. Well, you might get a couple hundred thousand pounds per year sold under that. So typically a utility will ask for a ceiling. And if a utility asks for a ceiling, we'll always ask for a floor. And what's happened over the last 18 months is just a structural shift up of where floors are sitting and ceilings are sitting. I can't speak for other producers, but I know that when we're in the market contracting today, we're looking for $50 escalated floors and higher, and we're looking for mid 80 escalated ceilings and higher. And the with each turn of a market related contract, you turn those higher. And as the spot price goes up and the term price goes up, then you just want to capture more of that forward value. That's where we want to be right now. And it's really important for investors to understand because they, they'll often be misled by some, especially new entrants to this market who go, oh, well, we don't want to give upside leverage. And so they'll say things like, we're going to be spot exposed out into the future. Absolutely the foolish way to think about it in our market. You don't want to be spot exposed. You want to be market related in the future. In other words, you don't want to build productive capacity as a producer and sit on it and try to jam it through the spot market when it becomes available. You want to build homes for it now, but you want those homes to have leverage to future prices. So if you think about the way we build a contract portfolio, our leverage comes in two main forms. The first is our current committed sales that are market related. So we call that portfolio leverage. As prices go up, our portfolio prices go up. But then we have pipeline leverage. At this point in the cycle, we have a lot of pounds under negotiation. They're not priced yet by definition, and they are completely levered to the future. And as the prices go up in the near term, then we can negotiate additional value capture in the stuff that we haven't committed to yet. So portfolio and pipeline leverage builds homes, keeps productive capacity out of the spot market, but gives you participation in a market that we think needs to improve. 
but gives you downside protection if somebody shows up with an asset and starts to jam it through the spot market and pushes the price down like other producers have done in the past, well, then you're protected from that. So this is a contracting strategy fit for purpose the way the uranium market works. All very interesting points. So that's a good overview of what's happening on the uranium side. Now, another very critical role that Cameco plays within the fuel cycle is conversion. And Cameco operates the only conversion facility in Canada. And so I want to also discuss this, but what's nameplate capacity at Port Hope and what is its current capacity? Yeah, and uh, conversion is, I'm absolutely delighted that people are paying attention to it for, you know, 48 of the last 50 years, nobody cared about the conversion part of the business. We we never got asked about it, but but obviously with what's going on in this market, with utilities coming to the market and looking on a self-sanctioning basis to replace their dependence on Russian enriched uranium product, it actually has a cascade upstream. Because if you're replacing Russian enrichment, Russian enrichment as a service used to show up in the Western market because it was attached to a canister of UF6. So if you're shunning Russian enrichment, you're actually out the conversion in the uranium that it's attached to. So no surprise, you've seen upward pressure in the conversion space as well. If you have more Western enrichment, you need more Western conversion. So conversion is receiving a lot of attention right now. As you mentioned, in the West, we have one of the very important facilities in Port Hope. It's the only one running in North America right now. The other one, the Converdine facility, is ramping up to return to the market. Uh, but I, I believe they haven't declared commercial production yet at that facility. Then you have a third facility in, in Europe, and Rano owns it. It's in Trikistan in France, and, uh, and, and it's running below nameplate capacity. And then, of course, there's a facility in the UK. If all of those were up and running, Western conversion can almost match Western demand. But right now, that's not the case. You've got the Port Hope facility running. You've got the French plant, plant running. So we've been looking to increase production at Port Hope, where nameplate is about 12. I think license is 12,500. What's required to get there is, you know, just your usual maintenance and replacement capital, a little more activity on site. But conversion's just like uranium. Y you don't build productive capacity and then start knocking on people's door and saying, well, do you wanna buy some conversion? You wait for the demand to come to the market, then you make the production decisions in order to produce into that committed sale. So conversion continues to be uh, a, an important part of the nuclear fuel cycle. There's a lot of attention on it. We continue to do a lot of forward contracting for our conversion service. Um, and we expect that to continue because it will take time for the Western supply to match the Western demand. And as long as the self-sanctioning is going on, it, it should, should suggest a, a pretty long tail of, of demand for conversion going forward. So Cameco is involved in all facets of the fuel cycle with the exception of enrichment. Is this something Cameco would look at in the future? Well, ab absolutely. Uh, we've always wanted to be in the enrichment business. I think you can go back, we're 35 years old to this year. Uh, I think this in a couple of weeks, we're 35 years old. I think you'll always find references to enrichment in our disclosures in that entire time. Enrichment's just a very important piece of our industry. Uh, after years of trying to buy our way into existing enrichment and, and not being able to do that, we decided in 2008 to explore our way in, explore our way in through a third generation technology called global laser enrichment. And it's had, you know, moments of promise. And then, of course, there were many years where the enrichment price was very low. It was an oversupplied market, thanks to the Russians. But now with everything going on in this market, this self-sanctioning, this moving away from Russian enrichment, there's a swim lane for global laser enrichment. And that swim lane ranges from re-enriching depleted UF6 in the United States to produce natural UF6 to help solve the conversion problem that we just talked about, all the way through to high levels of enrichment, up to 19.75% for some of these advanced nuclear reactors. And then of course, the big one right down the middle is just regular LEU to replace the Russians. So we're really excited about this project. 
But again, just like conversion and just like uranium, you have to build the support case for making an investment like in GLE. And that is, you have to continue to advance the technology, which we're doing with our partner Silex, really happy with the performance there. You have to figure out what the pathway is from a market opportunity point of view. There's legislation to ban Russian uranium, but it's in draft form, or Russian EUP, it's in draft form. It, at the moment, the Russians are not banned, from accessing any Western markets. So you'd want some certainty and predictability on that. And then of course you wanna build a support case with the utilities. The, the last thing you wanna do is build a uranium mine, build a conversion plant, build an enrichment facility, and then start knocking on people's doors and trying to sell it. That's not the way our market works. A utility never has substantial in-year demand for when your production is there. You always have to be very, very thoughtful in building the support case going forward. So same discipline we apply to uranium, we will apply to an entry into the enrichment space, but the opportunity has never been brighter. Grant, you made mention earlier that we were both in London for the World Nuclear Symposium, and I'm sure you met with many buy side investors. I wanna get a sense of the, the investors you met with. Are they long only funds, hedge funds, family offices focused on energy, ESG? Yes, <laughs> I would say it's all of the above. I, for the last about two and a half years, as the clean energy story became more and more about nuclear power, and then that collided with an energy security story, because if you have nuclear power, not only is it clean, but the nature of nuclear power and the nature of the way a nuclear power plant is, is fueled these things run for a long time and then they have some inventory attached to them. They're very, very secure sources of power at a time when folks are worried about gas supplies and they're worried about uh, building grids with uh, thermal based generation. So as that started to pick up, our origination has never been higher. Um, our vice president of investor relations, Rochelle Girard, uh, it's, it's weekly that, that we're having introductory meetings with big institutionals, with family offices, with hedge funds, with, with folks that have never looked at the nuclear industry before and never thought about the upstream value that can be created, you know, may have always thought of us as a mining company, for example, and thought of us as kind of a spot commodity. And then they get to know the industry and they get to know how we contract and how we build durable value going forward with investment grade utilities. And they like that and they like it a lot. And so they, they normally wouldn't have wandered into the resource world, but they like the way we build value in the resource world. So um, that origination continues to be high, a lot of new introductory calls. Uh, and then obviously the follow-up with, with long-term shareholders who have been very delighted with the recognition across the capital markets of the role that a company like Cameco can play in this. So we just continue to, to be very busy on that front, telling the Cameco story telling the nuclear story and making sure that maybe what escaped the transition last time, uh, making sure that investors don't, aren't misled about the uranium market, that they understand the unique market structure. If, if what you want is spot exposure, stay away from the uranium industry. But if what, it, what, it, if what you want is a company that can take what can be a quick move in a commodity price, but lock that in for long-term value, then you're gonna like the uranium sector and you're gonna like the way Cameco does things. But we, we've got just a, there's a higher level of understanding among the global investor base about how the market works and how the market's structured and what the industrial landscape is and a lot more interest in the downstream than there was in the past. And, and an understanding that yeah, being a uranium only producer is, it's interesting, but it doesn't create as much potential value as actually being across the whole value chain. So we've just seen a, a step change increase in investor understanding of just how exciting this investment opportunity is. Grant, as we wrap up, I wanna get your thoughts on M&A within the uranium sector. In the lithium sector, we have seen a, a lot of direct investments by OEMs into producers, but also Explorcos. We've seen lithium producers invest in, in small Explorcos. 
Do you think we'll see that within the uranium sector whereby a utility, for example, might come in and make an investment in a producer or a developer? It's happened before, so obviously not prepared to rule it out. But here's the context. A long-term contract is the way a utility builds a reliable supply chain. So in the uranium industry, actually, that direct relationship with the supplier to avoid an intermediary, to not rely upon traders and brokers and a metal exchange, well, that's always been there in the uranium sector. So for the vast, the vast majority of utilities around the planet, it's that direct long-term contract with an incumbent supplier who has licensed permitted facilities, who has multiple sources of production, who has a presence in the market in order to, you, you can count on them to always deliver. That's what's always replaced the need to sort of jump all the way upstream and invest in your own supply. It's happened in the past, and I would say with very little success, um, because a major, like Hamico, well, we don't need an invest. We don't need a utility to invest with us uh, in developing our assets. We don't develop our assets till the demand is there, and we built the book for it, and we have the cash flow to develop it. So then, that often leaves the only opportunity to be partner with a junior. And it's the history tells us it's very difficult for a nuclear utility to get their head around the challenge of developing a greenfield. In the nuclear world, it's about precision and it's about repetition, and it's about doing things at a 99.9996 six sigma level of precision. That's not mining. When we bring a nuclear engineer to a mine and they understand that our mining engineers have never seen the same ground twice. You know, the hundreds of millions of pounds that have come out of MacArthur River, it's never come out exactly the same twice. There's too much variation in mining. There's too much risk in mining. So the typical nuclear engineer goes, whoa, I, I, you, you take on that risk. We'll sign a long-term contract. If you have any production issues, that's on you to source. I'm not taking that risk. So I, I would never say never, but the history has not been good. And long-term contracts are a very, very effective way for nuclear utilities to have a relationship with the supply side without actually taking on that risk of greenfield development. And it goes back probably to your opening question. The only people who say this is easy are the people who have never done it. Well, that's a great way to wrap up. And I wanna thank you very much for spending time with us today, Grant, and providing insights. Yeah, great to catch up with you as always and uh, look forward to doing it again.